up in here. We good. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, or as we say in the Moab Temple, Nugazareti U. That means peace to you. My name is Moa Oludumari, and today we are going to speak on, I believe, a good lecture today is anger or ashe. Uh, before we start it, I would like to introduce y'all a little bit to our language, our Moa language, uh, in an opening prayer. Amago titi u Olodumare. Increase a azagi na ashe. Awendaze mi agbo ti u. Vagobe na a shangi uf u. A shange uf bla. Uf knare uf ubamu uf nugazere ashe. Aloji Olodumare wendize of lagwa. Ni ahm uf unite moa. Ni agbo uf. Owa funduse ashe ashe o. What does that prayer mean? That prayer is, I must become as you, Olo Dumari. Increase in me understanding of consciousness. I give my spirit to you. See in me a man of you, a man of love, a man of knowledge, a man of understanding, and of, uh, of peace. Ashe. Praise Olo Dumari, the giver of life. The creator of the universe, the uh, the spirit of our ancestors, Ashe Ashe O. So again, today we're gonna speak on anger or Ashe. Uh, I started doing the lecture for this one about two weeks ago, since the last one, and I believe it's something interesting to go into because I want to show how we as a people are having another war being cast upon us in a whole different way. We know about the war of economics. We know about the war of injustices. We know about the war of politics. We know about those things that, that we always say. We know about the war of history and so on and so forth, things like that. But I want to speak on another war that is in front of us at all times, but we tend to overlook it because we see it as something that's natural. And that's the uh, that's the the war on our emotions, in particular anger. And what we're going to speak on is how anger is literally killing us, and we're going to speak on how we can use a different and more powerful kind of energy to tackle our trials and tribulations with the ashe. What is the ashe? The ashe is the spiritual principle of you. That's the creative principle of you. That is who you are when we do the exercise of I am seeing my future. In the, in the Christian terminology, it will be the spirit or the Holy Spirit. In the Hindu vocabulary, it will be the Atman or the, or the prana, the, the breath or the spirit. In different uh, cultures, they have different ways of speaking on this very same thing. But we're going to speak it on it in our language in, in the Moa temple way of anger or ashe. Now we're going to start off with a Bible verse, Psalms 37 verse 8, where it says, Cease from anger and forsake wrath, fret not thyself in any wise to do evil. Now those who know me understand that I love to... Uh, break things down in, in its Hebraic origin and things like that. So we're going to do that with cease. Cease meant to abate or let alone. Anger came from the number 639, meaning rapid breathing in, uh, in passion. Wrath, anger also goes to breathing hard, be enraged, be angry or displeased. Forsake came from 5800, meaning commit oneself, fast, forsake, help, leave, destitute of, refuse. Wrath meant Anger, poison, anger, bottles, hot displeasure, furious, heat, indignation, poison, wrath, rage, to be hot, get heat, be hot, conceive, be warm, curdled milk or cheese, wall of protection, wall, walled, do evil, to make or be good for nothing, afflict, associate those who use you, do harm, do, men, uh, do mischief, punish, and vex. Heavy, right? And when we see that anger is from the jump, 
is equated with evil. And why would anger be equated with evil when anger would seem to be the natural response when one is getting attacked or so? Especially with us who's been dealing with over 400 years worth of attack. And you would think that being angry would be a natural response to the attacking that's going on us, right? But, you know, I know you know I'm a boxing fan. And I love boxing. I used to box myself, but I'm still following it. And, I, uh, and one of my favorite boxers is Floyd Mayweather. And one of his fights, I think it was his 49th fight, possibly, I believe. Uh, he went against a brother named Andre Berto, right? And Andre Berto gave one of the best interviews about what it's like to fight Floyd Mayweather. And he was like, the thing about Floyd is, no matter how much he is under attack, He's real calm and he's real aware. He, he, he noticed his breathing. He noticed his awareness. He said like when he's throwing punches at you and you miss, you, you, you will see Floyd like literally watching the fist going by like this. The fist going by like this. He'll know when to punch, when to hold, when to look at the clock, when to push away and so on and so forth. What he was doing was he, he was showing how calm, cool and collected that it was. And, and even in between rounds, what Floyd would do, he would look over to the other, uh, to the other corner to see if, if the, his opponent was breathing heavily. Because that was a sign of fatigue. So Andre Burner would be like, right, you know, I tried to sit up real quick so he don't see me breathing heavy because I'm tired and things like that. But, but remember already, anger meant rapid breathing. Rapid breathing in this sense brought fatigue. Anger Bringing high, heavy breathing is equated with fatigue. Let's go deeper. In the brain, I've been studying the brain a lot lately. Neuroscience and such and things like that. And in the brain, there's a part of it called the amygdala. And the amygdala controls the fight or flight uh, aspects of your brain. Whether you're going to fight or you're going to run. Right? Now, if that part of your brain is left unabated, if you just allow it to run wild, it will take control of your prefrontal cortex the prefrontal cortex is the part of the brain that regulates decision making and behavior so the if the prefrontal cortex is clouded by the fight response of the amygdala what happens then is we black out you know how we say uh we see red we black out or you get so angry you be going in and you don't even know that you did what you did until it's over so what Andre Berto, when he was talking about Floyd Mayweather, what he was saying is how perfect his amygdala and his prefrontal cortex was in balance. Because he had, he was fight, he understood the fight and flight thing perfectly. He knew when to attack. He knew when to back up. He knew when to hold. He knew when to push away. He knew when to be on the bike. He knew when to hit low. He knew when to hit high. And he never got flustered. Even times... When he got hit crazy by like Shane Mosley almost knocked him out like in the second round. He kept his composure. He held on to him. Went to his corner. Got the advice he got from his, his uncle and his, his father. Went back in and totally dominated the fight for the rest of that. For the rest of the fight. I don't think Shane won another round after that. You know. Um, so there's a lot of life lessons to be learned in boxing. And with that mindset of keeping calm, even in the state of attack, when you keep calm in a, take, in a state of attack, you, your, your prefrontal cortex is not being clouded. And if your prefrontal cortex is not being clouded, you're able to think clearly even while you're being attacked. So anger, anger equates to evil when it's not checked by your prefrontal cortex. Your prefrontal cortex, again, it, it, that's the part of your brain that deals with decision making and behavior. So that's where your culture is. That's where your principles are. And anger, which was real weird to me, when it said that it, that it acts like curdled milk or cheese. <laughs> for all things, for anger to be boiled down to in the Hebraic sense, it meant curdled milk or cheese. I was like... Why, why is it called curdled milk or cheese? Then I thought about it. When you eat too much curdled, when you eat too much dairy, milk or cheese, what that does is it blocks your arteries. So when it blocks your arteries, 
that can cause heart attacks. And the same is true with anger. So anger can literally kill you because it acts like curdled cheese and dairy inside of your arteries, which can literally cause you to have a heart attack. We'll get into that a little bit later. But Olo Dumari's will is that his ashe flows through you and not anger. The anger will block, will be like a wall, like it said uh, over here. It will be like a wall that blocks your ashe, your creative principle. Anger blocks your ashe. There was a movie that I was watching a while, it was years ago, I believe now. And it, 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 was, a, it was a boxing movie. And it said that anger is the wind that blows out the flame of your mind. So when you're standing upon your foundation of ashe, your natural creative principle, you can be under attack like Floyd Mayweather was. But when you're cool-minded and you understand your creative principle, you will see the attacks coming and you will think clearly while these attacks are coming and you will not be flustered by the attacks from the crazy people at your job, from the police, from whomever, from random racist people or whatever the case may be. Because when you look at these childish ass racist people, all they do is act like children trying to get a reaction out of you. And that's the same thing with these racist punk ass cops. They try to get a reaction out of you. So when you act irrationally, when you act outside of your prefrontal cortex, they got you because now you're not thinking in the way that you're acting. Verse 23. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. And though he may fall, he is not utterly cast down. For the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. The steps of a good man. That word man, first of all, comes from 1397. It doesn't literally just mean man, meaning a person with a penis. <laughs> man means warrior. So the steps of a good warrior are ordered by Olo Dumari. And he delighteth in his way. And though he may fall, he is not utterly cast down. For Olo Dumari upholdeth him with his hand. What does hand mean? Hand comes from... 3027 in the concordance, meaning power, means direction, ministry, and fellowship. So a good warrior is ordered by Olodumari. And Olodumari upholds him with his hand. Olodumari upholds him with his, with his power, with his means, with his direction, with his ministry, and with his fellowship. Anger will cause you to forget your fellowship with your creator that you say that you believe in. But you're a Christian though, right? You're a Muslim though, right? You practice Ifa though, right? Then you have no business being afraid. You have no business being angry. Because you know wherever you are, God is. We looking up in the sky, waiting for God to return. Oh, that's the biggest trick. The resurrection of Christ is within you. Christ already gave us his example of what perfected discipleship is. And if we just mimic his steps, have his steps ordered the same way if we if we have our steps ordered the way that his steps was ordered, we will be okay. Our Yoruba ancestors understood the importance of being cool-headed as well. You know, did you know that the whole idea of, yo man, be cool or chill, chill out, that came from our Yoruba ancestors. They had a saying, 
it, it meant the mystic coolness. It was called Atutu, I-T-U-T-U, -T -U, which meant to cool the face. Remember what anger meant. Hot, hot-headed, hot-faced, so on and so forth. But the Atutu meant to cool the face. It was originally a part of the, the offerings that we would give to our gods to cool the face of the gods to calm down the anger, to, to calm down the wrath of the, of the supernatural powers. But it then became to mean a, a, as, a, as a signifier of one's character. It's always, boys, it always boils back down to character. The I-2-2 meant to cool the face. It exhibits grace under pressure. In the book, Flash of the Spirit, it explains it like this. As we become noble, fully realizing the spark of creative goodness God endowed us with, we found confidence to cope with all situations. This is Ashe. This is character. This is mystic coolness. All one. I'm going to read that one more time. He said this is Ashe. The coolness of your face. As we become noble. As we become noble. We find confidence to cope with all kinds of situations. Remember confidence. Faith. That's the confidence. We'll get back to that. This is Ashe. This is character. This is mystic coolness. All one. And I would like to add that faith is a part of that all one. Because again, in Hebrews 11, 1, what does it say? Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not yet seen. We always go over this. What was faith? We didn't go over faith, what faith actually was. The word faith. Faith meant truth itself when it goes down to the concordance number 4102. Substance meant confidence or confident person. So faith is the substance of things hoped for. So the things that we're hoping for, that substance is faith. And what that substance is, is confidence in yourself. And when you have confidence in yourself, you don't have to rely on anger because you are flowing with God's ashe. The coolness of face. The able to show grace and no matter what your situation might be. Because if they can throw you off of your square, as they always say, they got you. Because if you're getting thrown off your square, then you're off balance. So the truth is, faith, truth is, the truth is, brothers and sisters, is that your confidence is all you need to be as God. You want to be Christ-like? Get your confidence game up. You want to be like the Orishas, right? Get your confidence game up. You want to be like Brother Malcolm. <laughs> get your confidence game up. Whomever, get your confidence game up. Because when it boils down to it, everything that we went through as a people in this country was a stripping away of our confidence. They took our language away so we couldn't describe our confidence. They took our spirituality away because we, so we couldn't pray in a confident way. They took our culture away so we couldn't move and live and dance and feel in a confident way. And then they covered all of that with a bunch of uh, inconfidence. Inconfidence? Unconfidence? I don't know. <laughs> but you feel what I'm saying? They took away our language of being cool, the I-2-2 too, too, with being, I'm ashamed of myself. I'm not as smart as them over there. I'm not as pretty as those over there. What did Brother Malcolm say? Who taught you how to hate your nose? The color of your skin? The shape of your lips? Who taught you how to hate yourself from the crown of your head to the soles of your feet? All these things was to take away your confidence. Now we understand that when they take away your confidence, what they're doing is taking away your faith that you have in yourself. 
the Honorable Elijah Muhammad always says that when it comes to spirituality, we're not talking about no spookism. And I'm understanding that more and more every day. We're not talking about no pie in the sky waiting for the clouds to open up and a chariot to come down. That is you. God created us with everything that we need to do to change the world immediately. But we feel that we need to vote to these politicians to make the change happen. We'll get into that. <laughs> your ashe is your creative principle. Your confidence, your faith is the truth itself. So confidence in oneself will make anger useless. Confidence in oneself will make anger useless. You won't need anger no more if you're confident in yourself. So what does that mean? You're confident in Oladumari's presence. And when his ashe is flowing for you, you don't need the lower vibration of anger. Anger is the lower vibrational version of ashe. As above, so below. Anger is the lower vibrational version of Ashe. They got us acting outside of our nature. They got us acting below and not above. Now, wait a minute, though. Isn't anger natural? Isn't it just one of those emotions that, that goes along with everything else? We'll get into that. But before we do, let's ask ourselves first. What is anger? We get angry, but we don't know what anger actually is. We have this natural assumption that anger is natural, but I actually looked up what anger is in the dictionary. And it meant a strong feeling of annoyance, displeasure, or hostility. And it has roots in the Old Norse language, A-N-G-R, meaning grief, deep sorrow, or to be vexed. What I like to call anger is a conscious, a conscious reaction to an indifferent stimulus. A conscious reaction to an indifferent stimulus. What the? What? Whatever happens, happens. But it's up to us whether it's going to be a positive situation or a negative situation. I learned that from my guru, Paramahamsa Yogananda. He said that all situations are neutral. But it's up to the consciousness of the person whether it's going to be a joyous one or a not so joyous one or a happy one or a not so happy one. He said that a person in heaven can turn heaven into hell with the perception that they have of it in their mind. And a person in hell can do likewise the opposite. They can be in the most hellish situations, but if they have a heaven type consciousness, they can have heaven even while they are in what they call hell. So, we know anger has arrived in our body when we clench our fists, grind our teeth, increased heart rate, but what if when we notice that in our body, instead of acting out in this, we increased our ashe, increased our awareness of our ashe, increased our creative natural, our natural creative principle towards whatever it is that's causing this uh, great displeasure. Because if we applied our creative principle, we would actually solve problems instead of just being angry about the problems. <sighs> I guess it's time to get a little controversial here now, I guess. Because all of these protests that are going on right now, it's recording, right? All these protests that are going on right now, Bored, bored them down. They're nothing more than we are angry rallies. We're angry. We're angry. We're angry. Right? And the protesters are arrogant enough to think that those in power 
should and would give a damn about them being mad. We don't care if you're mad. For example, for example, the women's march on, on Washington, you know, the grab them by the pussy march. <laughs> That in Washington alone drew between 500,000 and 1 million people. Nationwide, it had 3.2 million to 5.2 million. This is back in 2016. Black Lives Matter. That was tweeted 30 million times. And uh, I think I guess, I guess overall it was, it was 30 million times. So that's 30 million people tweeting I'm mad. And upwards of 6 million women marching in anger, but to no avail. Why? Because you feel that screaming, tweeting, singing, signing, being mad, forwarding, sharing, blogging is action. You believe that it's action, right? Well, what if all the people that you're Marching, singing, tweeting, retweeting, blogging, singing too, is simply not listening. What if they don't read your blogs? What if they're not listening to your songs? What if they're not even in the city at the time you're doing your marches? Then what the hell is the point <laughs> of all of this? What is the point? But you feel good. You feel good about it because the dopamine is being released in your brain. That's the pleasure sensor. You're like, yeah, God, yeah, yeah. I was there and I, you know, threw my flag up and did that. Whoop de whoop. Got ran over by a car and you know what I'm saying? And I got the scars to prove it to let you know that I was there. And whoop de whoop, whoop de whoop, but nothing got accomplished. But you getting sprayed by dog hoses, uh, water hoses. But you getting bit by dogs. But you getting ran over. God damn, that gotta suck to come to that realization that this that precious sister who got killed, doing what I I know she believed what she was doing what was right. But she ended up getting killed and nothing got accomplished. Just one angry person versus another angry person who allowed their amygdala to overthrow their prefrontal cortex to have them drive through a Crowd of people killing people. People got injured and people die. People get beat up and bleed all day, every day. And we confuse that with action, but nothing has ever came from, af from after that. So they, they, they have no problem renting you out these places. Sure. Come on down to the state house to do your march. Come on down to uh, bring them by droves. Bring them in. Bring them by droves. <laughs> we'll even put you on camera to satisfy your ego. We'll put you on tonight's news. We'll interview your leader. We'll do all of that. But so what? Because you did all that angry protesting. This is around, if we add all these people between the Black Lives Matter and the Women's March and all that, that's around 36 million people. Now, if 36 million people came together to apply their creative aspect of themselves, their ashe, they could have came up with a creative solution for this problem. But instead, all these people just came around just to say that I'm angry. And you should do something because I'm angry. They don't give a damn that you're angry. We've been angry for over 400 years here. And right when you think you're about to do something, they'll give you a little embellishment, a voting rights bill or a civil rights bill or a desegregation bill just to calm you down just enough. You better look up that quote from Lyndon B. Johnson. We'll give them little privileges here, but not enough to make lasting change. I have them niggas voting Democratic for the next 200 years. That's not a direct quote, but that's close enough. Boy, was he right. 
But none of that creative spirit, your ashe was not placed to destroy patriarchy or racism. All you did, it's recording, right? <laughs> All you did was stimulate their economy for them to continue doing what they're doing. Bring on 500,000 people to my city so you can protest. Bring on a million people to my city that you so you can protest and do whatever it is that you're doing. Because at the end, that means 500,000 people are going to be staying at my hotels. That's going to be a million people that's going to be eating at my restaurants. That's going to be 500,000 to a million people that's shopping at my malls. Because, you know, like, we're not going to just go down there for one day. Of course not. We're not just going to go down there one day just to protest and go home. I might as well make a whole weekend out of it. So I might as well stay a day and a half or two at the Hilton or whatever the case may be. And while I'm here, I might as well see what their malls and stuff are looking like. Look, You know, holler at their street vendors and so on and so forth. Go to their Starbucks and go to their McDonald's and so on and so forth. All this money is being taxed by these 500,000 to a million, 3.2 million, 5.2 million, 30 some odd million people. Going back and being taxed to fuel the same system that you're protesting against. Checkmate. And on top of that, I ain't going to do nothing about it. What are those 36 some odd million people said, you know what? We're actually going to do and sustain an actual boycott. 36 million people. That's more than... That's a, that's a lot of people. <laughs> that's more than some small countries. 36 million people. And that's just the women... The women um, march and the um, Black Lives Matter thing to combine. What if those people came together under that same... A belief of injustice and be like, you know what? We are actually going to sustain. We are going to destroy an industry with a continued boycott. Oh, then something will happen for real then. We had that opportunity. <laughs> but pardon the pun, we fumbled. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy, we fumbled that one. We had the perfect opportunity but we don't have the discipline enough cease from anger and forsake wrath why let's look at what the national institute of clinical application of behavioral medicine breaks down anger step number one the first spark of anger activates the amygdala before you you're even aware of it step two the amygdala activates the hypothalamus. Part three, the hypothalamus signals the pituitary gland by discharging a, a choreocotropin releasing hormone, or CRH. Four, the, pitu the pituitary activates adrenal glands by releasing adrenocortotropic hormone, or ACTH. Five, the, adren the adrenal glands secrete stress hormones such as cortisol, uh, adrenaline, and noradrenaline. An elevated cortisol causes loss of neurons in the prefrontal cortex. Mm -hmm. This is what clouds your judgment. It also kills neurons in the hippocampus and disrupts the creation of new ones. This weakens your short-term memory. So think about all those times when people say they get angry, they black out, mess around, kill their whole family, and then they come at it like, what did I do? I did that? I did that. This is also why you come up with the best responses to an argument after the argument is done. You're like, God damn it, I should have said that. You, come on, right? You're like, oh, I could have, oh, I should have said it. But the anger got so out of control that it blocked your own short-term memory. Look at what things that simple anger is doing. It also decreases serotonin, the hormone that makes you happy, which in turn makes you feel anger and pain more and increases aggressive behavior, which leads to depression. 
Anger leads to depression. And it makes perfect sense. What else does it increase? It increases your heart rate, your blood pressure, uh, your artery tension, your blood glucose, your blood fatty acid, the number of virus uh, infected cells. It increases the incidence of cancer, dry mouth, migraines, headaches, and intraocular pressure. You know, when your eyes get all tight and things in your head. What does it decrease? It decreases your thyroid function. It decreases your natural killer cells, your blood flow, metabolism, eyesight, and, blood, and bone density. This is just anger. This is what anger does to our body. Anger can clog your blood vessels and damage them to the point that you have a stroke or a heart attack. There are studies on how to, de to decrease the, the occurrence of stroke and heart attack along with diet. They're now saying, calm down. This is just from being angry. And this is why the Bible says, cease from anger. Because the Bible itself broke it down to rapid breathing, poison, and heat. This is from a 2,000-year-old book. According to Dr. Henry Mills, anger is not an emotion that we were born with. Rather, it is one that is learned. He says, as children, we are learned, we learn by copying the behavior of the people that's are, that are around us. So the question then becomes is what environment is around us? What people are around us and what example are we providing not only for ourselves but also to our children? Not only that, what communities that we call hoods? Why are they in the condition that they are in? Why is there trash all over the streets on our neighborhood, but not in that neighborhood? Why are the streets smooth and painted in one neighborhood and not the other neighborhood? Why do we not have the same issues on Broad River as we do in Lake Murray? <coughs> Live PD don't go over there as they do over here. Live PD was just in this neighborhood a couple days ago. Why is Live PD over here and not over there? Why isn't there the consideration of how these metal detectors in these fogged windows are affecting the mental health of our children? I was blessed enough to be uh, raised in a District 5 school. We ain't had to deal with none of that. Nowadays, they say like they graduate with majors and minors in high school. Why doesn't Columbia College have that? Why doesn't LR have those same... Opportunities as Dutch Fork. Why is it when I buy an, uh, an apple that I have to wash the wash wax off of my apple over here and not wash wax off of the apple when I buy it from over there? Why is wax on the damn apple in the first place? If God didn't put it there, who are you? The reason is, is that we're dealing with another war that's right in front of us that we don't see it because we've been born into it so much that we think that it's natural. We've been born into anger that we think anger is natural. There's a war of emotional trauma. It's a war of dissatisfaction, frustration, judgment, rejection, and fear. These are the things that they say are the sources of anger. Dissatisfaction, frustration, judgment, rejection, and fear. That is how anger is defined, but your brain interprets it as stress. Stress. 
The secret war is stress. And that stress is causing you to get hot-headed and act irrationally. Go on Broad River, right up this street. Or look at any of the main streets of any low-income neighborhood where you might be from. And what do you see? Nothing but fast food restaurants, am I right? Hell, to get here, you got to drive between a KFC and a Taco Bell. Not to mention the Hardee's, McDonald's, the Church's Chicken, the Knicks, the Ocean View, the Lizard's Thicket, the Arby's, the Sandy's, the Bojangles, the Wendy's, the Zaxby's, the Chick-fil-A, the Cookout, in this area alone. And consider this. Isn't it interesting that they're called fast food chains? But check this out, family, to go even deeper. The consumption of these foods have the exact same effect on our bodies as anger. Junk food has a link to depression, high blood pressure, heart attack, and stroke, just like anger. Same with cigarettes, the same with drugs, the same with alcohol. All of these have the same effects on our body as the thing before. Depression, high blood pressure, heart attack, and stroke. You can get that from the anger in our communities. You can get that from the cigarettes that we smoke. You get that from the junk food that we eat. And we also get that from the, anchor, the alcohol that we drink. Now think about this. What's the legal age for you to be able to smoke cigarettes? 18, right? Did you know that your brain is not fully developed until around the age 25? So you can smoke cigarettes at 18, your brain's not fully developed. You can drink alcohol at 21, even though your brain is not fully developed. And then we feed our babies these pounds and pounds of sugar and laugh when they get a sugar high. Do we not? But not understanding what we're doing is we're introducing our babies to an addictive behavior. And then these devils package them up in red and yellow. Every, every, uh, Restaurant you see is in red and yellow. Why? Because it triggers your appetite. And then they package it, put it with a toy, call it a happy meal. <laughs> so then what they're doing, they're attaching happiness, fun, positive memories with your child while feeding them this sugar-laced food, these sugar-laced burgers, fries, and drinks, and even in their salads. Mm -hmm. So now the baby fiends for McDonald's. Anybody with a child can say that I'm telling the truth. When they see McDonald's, what do they say? McDonald's! Ah! I'm gonna get a McDonald's! McDonald's! Am I lying? I know. We was the same way. I know I was. I was mad for my aunt for a long time when she ain't stopping McDonald's. I'm like, yo, you driving right past it. Yo, you driving? <laughs> Eddie Murphy was saying the same thing about the burgers. He said, like, I'm going to make a burger better than McDonald's. Better than McDonald's? <laughs> he come out with a, he's like, pass me that onion. I'm like, onion? There's no onions in the McDonald's. <laughs> but this has been always going on. <clears throat> Not knowing that they're lacing everything with sugar. Sodas are nothing more than liquid candy. So remember how we've all been introduced to this addictive behavior. Especially when you see our brothers and our sisters, a brother or a sister that might be strung out on coke. Cane. <laughs> I meant in this context. <laughs> and we laugh at our brothers and our sisters that's going through whatever it is that they're going through. But we're, while you're laughing at them, you're holding a Snickers bar. So while you're laughing at them going through their coked out episode, understand that you're holding the Snickers bar, which they both come from the same plant. They were just processed differently. 
Yours just became sugar. Theirs was cooked up in such a way that it became cocaine. The only difference between the two is the chemistry of how they came into physical manifestation. Okay, so what? What are you trying to tell us, Brother Moa? What I'm saying is, anger is not an emotion. Anger is an induced state. Anger is an altered consciousness that is just as unnatural as the food that we are consuming and the environment in which we live. That is blocking the light of our ashe as it blocks the blood to f freely flow through our arteries and veins. This is the war. Now before we get into how we can overcome it, because it can be overcome. I'm not one just to preach doom and gloom. And I'm not one just to talk about a problem without giving solutions. I'll leave that to those other folks that you all enjoy. We've seen the physical reactions to anger, but I went to the Bhagavad Gita, a Hindu scripture, for the characteristics of anger and the actual character of one who lives in anger. I would recommend you reading, well, one, reading the whole Bhagavad Gita. It's a beautiful book. But in particular for this lesson is read all of chapter 16. But I'm going to be bouncing a little bit around. In the Bible Haggita, Gita, chapter 16, verse 4, it said, hypocrisy, insolence, anger, cruelty, anger, uh, cruelty, ignorance, conceit. These, Arjuna, are the qualities of men with demonic traits. And if you was wondering, the divine traits was in verses 1 through 3. The divine traits was fearlessness, Purity of heart, persistence in the yoga of knowledge, generosity, self-control, nonviolence, gentleness, candor, integrity, disengagement, joy in the study of the scriptures, compassion for all beings, modesty, patience, a tranquil mind, dignity, kindness, courage, uh, courage uh, and a benevolent, loving heart. Lord Krishna agrees that anger is a demonic trait. As it said in the Bible. This is just some of the, the, uh, the signifiers of this demonic trait. In the Bible, Haggita chapter 16, verse 7. Demonic men realize, excuse me, demonic men do not realize what should or should not be done. We can stop right there. The demonic man does not know what should or should not be done. Why? Because your anger is blocking your creative reality. When you allow all of the Mari's ashe to flow through you, or in this case, the prana, the breath that, that makes you you, you know exactly what to do because all of the Mari's holding you up by his hand, which meant He's holding you up by your fellowship with him. But if you're angry, you're blocking that fellowship. So you don't, you're not in tune with the divine intelligence that you naturally have. So now you feel that you have to go outside of yourself to figure out what it is that you must do. Is that right? Verse 8. They say that life is an accident. Caused by sexual desire, that the universe has no moral order, no truth, or no God. The Honorable Louis Farrakhan says that the world makes evil fair seeming. Oh, it's okay. You can do that. Look, look, look on social media all the time. It's a whole bunch of people saying, oh, it's okay to be depressed. It's okay. We're, we're, I'm depressed too. Boo-boo. 
They make evil seem fair seeming. Like there is no nature at all. Like there's not a natural order. Like the divine mathematics for creation isn't man plus woman equals child. We are created to multiply. The demonic man says that there is no natural order. Connect those yourself. Verse 11. Tormented by a vast anxiety that continues until their death, convinced that the gratification of desire is life's sole aim. I was already controversial once. I might as well continue, right? Might as well. Anxiety. Everybody talks about anxiety, are they not? I'm anxious. Anxiety is a demonic trait. I'm not calling you a demon. I'm not calling you a demon. I love you. But it is a demonic trait. Because God gave you Ashe. But you're choosing to be anxious. Faith or fear, choose one. When you're not acting in your divine nature, you act outside of your nature. And when you act outside of your nature, you're acting out in fear, depression, and in anxiety. Why is anxiety a demonic trait, Brother Moa? I'm, glad, I'm so glad you asked. Because what is the base of anxiety? Fear. Right or wrong? But in verses 1 through 3 of the Baba Hot Gita, chapter 16, it said fearlessness is the trait of the divine. And in the Bible, it said that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, of love, and a sound mind. Am I right? So what does that mean? That means if you're living in fear, you are living outside of your divine nature. God didn't give you a spirit of fear. If God didn't give you a spirit of fear, then who did? You know, even in science, it says that the only two natural fears that humans being have is of, of loud noises and of falling. Everything else is made up. Everything else is made up. Google it. Whatever. You ain't got to believe me. But the only two natural fears that we have is falling from tall heights and of loud noises. So that fear of public speaking in your mind. That fear of pursuing your dreams in your mind. <sighs> Look how the Bible juxtaposes fear. If you're living in fear, that means you don't have power. If you're living in fear, that means you don't have love. If you're living in fear, that means you don't have a sound mind. Now, some translations of that of sound mind is self-discipline. So if you're living in fear, you don't have self-discipline, you don't have love, and you don't have power. What is the condition of the so-called black man and black woman today? Do we have power? Do we have love? Do we have self-discipline? Or do we have a hell of a lot of fear? Fear is the opposite. 
of power, love, and of sound mind. So instead of looking to Allah Dumari, Yahweh, Allah, Krishna, whomever you want to call. We're looking at the democratic, excuse me, democratic parties. Or we're looking at the reptiles of the Republican parties. Am I right or wrong? Tell me I'm lying. Everybody's coming around says, be sure you vote on November 6th. By all means do it. Especially on the local levels. That's okay. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with it. But what I'm saying is, is they're not the author and the finisher of you. You have something within yourself that's more powerful than all the voting in the world can do. I was speaking to a brother. And, you know, he was speaking on the, the importance of voting. And I'm not disagreeing. But he said, you know, when you vote, you got to stay on these people to make sure that they do what they said they was going to do. I said, well, brother, we got to look at the character of the people that we're voting in. Because if they're telling us these promises, but we got to stay up on them 24-7 to make sure that they keep their promises, that means that they wasn't intending to keep their word in the first place. That that means that they was just telling you whatever that they that you wanted to hear so you would hit that ballot box. I'm not going to get all into politics right now. That's for another time. But all I know is if the whole, what, 12% of the population, black folks, got together and used that $1.1 trillion together, we'd be all right. Group economics trumps politics all the time. That pun was intended, by the way. But we look towards the world's politicians to solve these problems, do we not? Well, no, we just got to get we just got to get a Democratic House and Senate and President in, and everything will be all right. We got to get these Republicans out. That's that's what the problem is. It's those Republicans. They've been up in there and messing everything up. Okay. Well, there was times in this society that it was a completely Democratic ran. And completely Republican ran. Am I right? All right. So there was enough money floating around to solve our, at least our country's hunger. Have they done it? There was There's enough vacant buildings to solve our homeless problem. Have they done it? There's enough money floating around to make sure that every child in this country has access to a decent education. Have they done it? Does police brutality still exist? Has it existed under Bill Clinton as it does under Obama, as it does under Trump, as it did under Bush? Has anything changed from there? Did it stop under Republicans? Did it stop under Democrats? There was a brother that was recently lynched. And then I heard it was two more brothers even after that. This year. Is that. Because it's Trump's fault. Is that because. Trump has emboldened racists. But they, they was hanging. Black folks. Since the beginning of this country. And every now and then. There'll be a sprinkled story of. One of our people being hung. With Democrats in office. With Demo uh, Republicans in office. Is justice being served equally? Or are we not fighting for the same things that our brothers and our sister elders was fighting for in the civil rights movement? Has equal justice been served? Has it been served under Bush? Under Clinton? Under Obama? Under Trump? Under a Democratic-run Senate and House? Under a Republican Senate and House? Has any of these things happened? But we'll have our lovely sister, Michelle Obama, on this vote.
Practice your power. This is your power, they tell you. This is your power. Vote. By all means, do it. Because, you know, allocation of money and so on and so forth. Whoop -dee -whoop. I'm not mad at that. I'm not mad at voting. But I'm not saying that that is your power. Because if all of us used our ashe together, if all of black people, hell, maybe in Colombia, got together, pulled our resources, Hey, we might be at least be able to pull together to build one school. Because, you know, we want better schools, but we send our kids to these schools that have these racist-ass teachers that's kicking out our babies because of the way that their hair naturally sprouts out of their skull. Am I wrong? Let me tell you something about the Ku Klux Klan. I have a book on them. Of course, I can't find it right. Oh, here we go. The Ku Klux Klan. In the city, 1915 to 1930. Dope book, by the way. They got this thing called the Invisible Kingdom. I think they call it the Invisible Kingdom. Or the Invisible Empire. The Invisible Empire. So they not, might not wear sheets no more. And we already know about the police department and so on and so forth. But you know what you overlook? Your kids' teachers. You know what you also overlook? Your doctors. You know what you also overlook? The people at the restaurant that's preparing your food. They used their ashe. Because we all have it. And Ashe is not a respecter of persons. It just has to be used. They use their creativity. They say, you know what? We can't be as overt with our racism anymore. We can't wear our sheets and cone head as things anymore. We can't just go out and shoot a nigga. As easily. But if I put on this police uniform. I got a badge of protection. I got a situation that. I can beat them the hell up. And if they hit me back. I can charge them with assault against an officer. The, the complexion of protection. They use their collective intelligence. To create a reality. While well, we thought it was sweet. The Baba Haggita, chapter 16, verse 12. Enslaved by their greed, they squander their time dishonestly, piling up mountains of wealth. Is that is this not what they do? <laughs> Is this not what they do? People we vote in? Of course there's good hearted people in there, sure. But these are your saviors, right? <laughs> like Michael B. Jones. This your king, right? <laughs> Hell no. But before we get all high and mighty, talking about the white man, Let's talk about ourselves. Do we not have this depressed ass wisdom going around on Facebook all the goddamn time that I'd rather cry in the Mercedes Benz than cry on a bike? Am I right or wrong? I'd rather cry in the Mercedes Benz than cry on a bike. But if you don't have enough self care for yourself, you can either drive or ride your bike right over that bridge and kill yourself mm -hmm. in that nice Mercedes Benz or that wonderful Huffy. <laughs> Is that not what they say? Mm -hmm. 
That money that you turn into a God. Do they not have that depressed ass wisdom? I'll be so depressed until I hear that sound that the ATM makes. Have you seen that one? I'm just focused on the money. Fuck friends. Ain't that what they say? I don't need friends. No new friends. No new friends. No new friends. No, no, no. Then you be posting all day talking about, I'm so lonely. Nobody loves me. But you got that money, right? I got that money. I got that money. That could be used to purchase the gun, to purchase the bullet that goes right through your own head. Am I right? But you got that money though, baby. These are the traits of the demonic man. But as the Honorable Louis Farrakhan said, they make evil seem uh, make it evil, fair seeming. Bunch of rich, depressed people out here. A bunch of people with money who can't be their actual selves. Which is why they overdose and do all that good stuff. But we live in a culture that promotes anxiety. I'm not pretty enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not strong enough. My abs don't show enough. And then even on the on the <laughs> on the flip side of that, there was a book in the library that said, it is okay to be fat. Do you know they made up this thing called fat phobia? Mm -hmm. Fat pho and they said that fat phobia is the new language of racism. I said, what the hell? <laughs> Sidebar. Why are all these random ass movements trying to hijack the movement that we have went through with racism for 400 years? And nobody lynching you because you fat. But they would they but they make evil fair seeming. It's okay to be fat, even though your heart is being being compounded with fat and stuff like that that's causing heart attacks and causing strokes. But it's okay to be fat because you're beautiful. I'm not saying that you're not beautiful brothers and sisters. But we need to take care of ourselves, do we not? Yeah. Yeah. I'm not being fat phobic to say that, yo, we might need to go out and walk. <laughs> I'm not fat shaming you. I'm trying to make sure you live in your best life. Mm -hmm. I'm not fat shaming you, brother. Sister, but if the war goes on right now, what you going to do? And then, let's say you're morbidly obese. Then on top of that, you're angry. And on top of that, you're eating the junk food. You're decreasing your life 10, 20, 30 times. Anger, food, environment. Don't, oh, let's not add if you smoke. Let's not add if you're doing drugs. Let's not add if you're drinking alcohol. Crazy. The very things that they promote all day, having fun. My drink in my two-step. My drink in my two-step. It's an older example. Pop the molly, I'm sweating. Woo! There was a, a, a period of time when molly was being promoted like crazy. What was that brother's name? He looked like a little... You know, you know, like, is that bad? Uh, Tiger. <laughs> yeah, it was a little, yeah. He said, like, it was a song called, I'm, like, it was like, looking for Molly. Look, you know what I'm saying? Future, Percocet. Molly, Percocet. Percocet. Before he even got into a verse, he shouting out, Percocet, Molly, Percocet. And then when you listen to the song, the song ain't got shit to do with Molly's a Percocet. So why, brother, do you act? Why, why, why? What is the purpose? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if the Percocet, the Mollies don't get you, they're they going to arrest you because you have it on you. 
So either you're going to die or get incarcerated. But this is the culture in which we live. But if you stand up and say, you know what? It's not natural for us to be morbidly obese. You're being fat phobic, fat shaming. It's not natural that two men or two women are supposed to be together. Ooh, you're being homophobic. Or if you stand up and say, like, brothers and sisters, it's not a natural state to be anxious and angry and depressed. Oh, you being whatever the hell. Am I right? Mm -hmm. all, these things, except all these things except yourself. So if, they're, if we're living in an anxious culture, that means we're living in a demonic culture then. Mm -hmm. Am I right? Based off of the definition that I gave in front of you? So we're living in a demonic culture and if we remain ignorant, we become the demons. Again, we're not speaking of no spookism. We're not talking about no demons that's way deep underground. We ain't talking about no devils that's way deep underground. And we ain't talking about some pie in the sky hoping that something will come out from the sky. Things like that. It's all us. It's easy to blame it or it's easy to give hope. To something way away, far away from you. And it's easy to blame something that you can't see. But when you see that anger and anxiety and going outside of nature is causing us as humanity, black people in particular, to destroy ourselves. It's harder to look in the mirror. Ain't that what Michael Jackson told us to do though? But the moment you know your God, your God, Allah, Yahweh, Oludumari, whomever, even if your God is peace, I'm with that too. But the moment you know it, you have that real relationship because we talk it all the time. People come up to me passing me these tracks that look like $100 bills messing up people that's homeless. I saw one that said, it was supposed to, you know, like fold it like it was a $100 bill and you open it up, it's not. It's like, is it, are you disappointed? <laughs> Jesus will never disappoint. It got me one time. What? That's neither here nor there, but anyway. But the moment that you have a legit relationship with your creator, the moment you know that wherever you are, that's where God is. The moment you know your nature with the Almighty, then you are free. Then we can do greater things than Christ, as Christ said we could. He said we'll be able to do greater things than he. Am I right? Then why are we not? Something is missing here. But these realizations must be coupled with action. Faith without works is dead. Which means what? Your confidence without works is dead. You say that you God, right? If you're not that extreme, you say you're a Christian, you're a Muslim, you're a Jew. Hindu or whomever, whatever. Whatever it is that you say that you are, you should be a representation of that God. Which means you should then move in a way that the world is not moving in. Am I right? In the world, but not of it. Am I right? Baba Gita, chapter 16, verse 17. Check this out. He's still speaking about the demonic nature and character. They go through outward forms of worship. But their hearts are elsewhere, clinging on to the eye sense, to power, to arrogance, lust, and rage. They hate me, denying my presence in their own and others' bodies. This is in the Baha Gita, chapter 16. Read it. Read the whole book. It's not that long. 
but we call ourselves gods and goddesses all the time. Am I right? Meaning when we call each other gods and goddesses, that means that I see the divinity in you and you see the divinity in me. In this term, it will be namaste. We call ourselves kings and queens all the time. Am I right? What that means is that means that you see the royalty in me and I see the royalty in you. Then if that's the case, why are some of these gods in our city treating their queens like whores? It's recording, right? Why are these so-called gods of our city treating their queens like whores? Why are they treating queens in general like whores? By your fruits, you will know them. Is that not what the Bible says? These so-called kings, you know what they love to do, baby? They love to hide behind this idea of polygamy. Well, you know, that's the natural way. You know what I'm saying? A man is supposed to have multiple women. You know what I'm saying? Because, you know, I'm a king. And kings, you know, Solomon had them and stuff like that. But Solomon was also able to take care of all of them, brother. Don't hide under the guise of polygamy to promote your own selfish desire and, and fantasy. You're not about polygamy. You're about your perverted fantasies. <laughs> In the Holy Quran, it says to have one wife is actually better. Because they understood that if you have multiple wives, you're going to naturally favor one over another. And once you favor one other than another, whew, <laughs> it's going to get real. Am I right? But where polygamy truthfully came from, real quick, say I have my brother right here. This is my man right here. We going to war, not us. To, we're going to war together against a common enemy. I have a wife and kids, or even if I just have a wife, and he has a wife. We go into war, fighting for our country. He dies. In that time, one of the worst things to be is a widow. Mm -hmm. So what I would do, because that's my man's, is that I would take on his wife and his children and bring them under my family. So that his wife and kids would have the protection of having a husband and a man in their lives. Their children would still have a male role model. And that, and, and, and that wife, that woman, would still <coughs> have help. And she wouldn't have to walk around with the scarlet letter of being a widow. That's where it came from. Not solely sexual desire. So why do you want to be polygamous? Why do you want to be polygamous? Do you want to be polygamous because you want to help take care of this woman, these women, and kids? Or do you only want women to have no kids? And sisters, why do you want it? Do you actually understand the purpose of it? Or is it just, there's just not a lot of good men around? Okay, I know. I'm the only one who sees this. It's only me. I know. I know. I'm bugging. I'm tripping. But look at the way that we treat each other. If you're denying the presence of God that's within myself, or you're, or if I'm denying the presence that's with of God that's within you, I hate God. This is what Krishna was saying. They hate me, denying my presence in their own and each other's bodies. 
they hate me. I mean, I used to say that when I was a kid. They'd be like, you know, when they used to make fun of me, they're like, yo, you ain't making fun of me. You making fun of God. Because God created me. So if you got beef with me, you got beef, you got beef with something beyond me, bro. It's just a little small stuff that we used to say all the time. That, like, makes so much sense now. So we were talking about how they do outward uh, forms of worship, but their hearts is elsewhere and so on and so forth. There was a post going around. Uh, I believe it was Brother T.D. Jake's daughter. Beautiful sister. Doing her preaching thing, getting it in. Was telling a stadium of women that you have reached your next level, sis. You said that We said that this was a convention, but we lied. This is your graduation. And the stadium erupted. Yeah! Woo! That's right! We gotta be careful with sensationalism. You mean to tell me, Sister Jakes, I'm assuming that's your last name, please correct me. You mean to tell me in that stadium full of thousands and thousands of women that every single one of them has graduated? That every single one of them has reached their next level. That every single one of them is on their next level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In what? A three-day conference? Mm -hmm. Am I right? Mm -hmm. We have these conventions and things like that. And they're like, yeah, you. this is your time. You have reached the next level. But there's a, there are brothers and sisters who are going through in deep, deep, deep mental and emotional turmoil. And they don't need your canned speeches. Am I right? You got them feeling good about themselves. You playing the music behind them. It's your time, sis. You graduated. You graduated. You elevated. You levitated. You no longer constipated. You're not constipated. You have related. So on and so forth. But then when they go into their real life the next day, what do they have? What have you given them? Other than a good time. You're not giving them therapy. You're giving them a three-day convocation that might be two hours apiece. So it's not even like the whole day, whole day. So it's like six hours out of 72. And you're just telling them that they have graduated and went on to the next level. Be careful. Be careful. Be careful because you saying that they leveling up and if they try to walk in a leveled up uh, leveled up way and they have not really leveled up and they fall and kill themselves and this, that, and the other, the blood is on your hands. <laughs> Who cares though, right? The music's good. The dancing is good. Am I wrong? You got to be careful. It's okay to speak things as they're not as though they were. But you got to be sure that these people are ready to level up the way that you're saying that they're leveling up. If you just jump in saying that you have leveled up and you have not had a one-on-one -on -one consultation with these people, you are just doing sensationalism and that's dangerous to do. Because these people are hanging on to your words. Yeah. Uh, T.D. Jake's daughter said, I leveled up. I've done stepped up and this and the other. So I'm going to go ahead and jump into a relationship even though I'm not actually ready. And now I done got into a relationship, got pregnant with somebody who I didn't want to get pregnant with. Now I'm a messed up mother. Now I'm a messed up wife. And this and the third because I thought that I've leveled up. Be careful. Be careful. You are the shepherds. We are the shepherds of the people. We are shepherds, man. 
And if all you're doing is entertaining our people instead of teaching them how to have a legitimate relationship with the creator, I would not want to be in your shoes. Faith without works is dead. You telling the sister that she leveled up, but she did not do the inner work to actually level up. You just told her that she leveled up. Now she's moving in a way that she's not prepared for. Be careful. Inner work requires repentance. We've all fallen before. It requires forgiveness of ourselves and others. Sometimes we must accept the apology that we have never gotten. We must release ourselves from the anger that has enslaved us. But first we must let each other know how anger has enslaved us. And we must become the guardian angel to ourselves. How, Brother Moa? I'm glad you asked. Most of y'all who, who know me has done the I am seeing my future exercise. We're going to do it one more time just in case people who might be watching on the live stream haven't done it before. Excuse me. Say this sentence quietly to yourself without using your physical mouth. Say, I am seeing my future on three. One, two, three. The question to ask yourself is, is what voice just spoke? On top of that, what ear just heard you say, I am seeing my future? So now let's try it again. This time, actually visualize your future without using your physical mouth. Say it again on three. One, two, three. The question now is to say is, what sight just saw your future? You, didn't, you wasn't using your physical eyes. Your eyes was either closed or you was looking at the screen or whatever the case may be. But you saw your future. So what that means is that you have another way of seeing, another way of speaking, another way of moving, grooving, and being while being in your current environment. Therein lies your power because you are able to see beyond your current environment. And once you're able to see beyond your current environment, then you'll be able to see that you're able to move beyond your current environment. Because everything that you are living now in your physical manifestation first started off as a thought. Everything started off as a thought. So let's do some inner work right now to help you along your way to heal so you can actually level up. Close your eyes. And you are with family and you are safe as I so decree. But this is going to be a exercise that might be difficult for some to do. But peace be still as you go through it. As I so decree, I say. Close your eyes and think of a traumatic time that happened in your life. Visualize yourself going to your younger self. And your younger self might be in a room crying to himself or herself, by themselves crying, feeling that pain that nobody else has felt before. Now you as yourself, go back to your younger self and give your younger self a hug. Embrace your younger self and allow your younger self to cry their eyes out into your chest and then look your younger self into the eyes and wipe their tears away. And when you do that, say to your younger self that I love you. Say to your younger self what you needed to hear, what you didn't hear when you was that younger self. Give yourself that love that was needed that it didn't get when you was that younger self. Hug yourself. Give yourself a kiss. Give yourself that love and attention that you didn't get. Do you see it? Look 
Get your younger self after you say I love it. Give yourself, your younger self permission to heal. Give that younger self permission to cry because you might not have been crying when you was younger because you felt that you didn't have the ability to cry. So when you visit your younger self as yourself, give yourself that uh, 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 permission to cry it out into yourself's chest right now. Say that I love you to yourself. Say, apologize to yourself. Forgive yourself if you feel that you made a mistake. Forgive the others who did what it is that got you feeling the way that you're feeling. It's okay to forgive. So when you forgive, you when you forgive, you release. Forgive yourself and others so you can release that anger that has been tying you down and weighing you down for so long. So you can now break the arrested development that you had. Now say to yourself, without using your physical mouth, to your younger self, look at, him, look at him or her in the eye and say that we are free now. Now, the light enters that room, which was always dark. That dark spot that was in your mind, that dark spot that was in the room of your mind, now a light shines through. And now a new elder of that is you is walking in that did not exist before because they was covered by the darkness of your anger that blocked it. And now that anger, now that elder stands both of you up. Now that elder is guiding you now uh, at this moment, at this point, as I so decree as the Issa Kore. Now that elder is guiding both of you with a clean slate. But that elder always reminds you that God has already forgiven you. It was you that hasn't forgiven yourself. The elder you that is now guiding you is showing you how your addictions originated and how they are not you. The elder you shows you the threefold interest to the hell that you have been living in. Desire, anger, and greed. The Bhagavad Gita calls those interests, interests soul destroying. Which is made manifest through your depression, your self-loathing, and your anger. The thing that the world promotes the most. Your elder self reminds you that the wise avoids these gates. Now open your eyes. Are we okay? As I so decree, that free elder self is that which guides you towards your current freedom. But be aware just as it was covered before, it can be covered again. It's never lost. It's never severed. It's never cut. It's never dismissed away from you. But just how it was covered with the muck of anger, the muck of self-loathing, the muck of depression, the muck of the weights, the muck of rape, the muck of abuse, the muck of not having, the muck of whatever. The feeling that came associated with all of those that covered your true free self, it can be covered again if you revert back to it. In church, we call that backsliding. But even then, even if you do backslide, you can always come back and recognize 
that you have always been free. You are always free and you will always be free because that is your natural state. Your elder self, your true free self is now guiding you. That elder self isn't the one that's smoking cigarettes no more. That elder is gone. You was creating a whole nother elder self when you was overeating. You was creating a whole nother elder self when you was smoking crazy. You was creating a whole nother elder self when you was drinking excessively. That elder self that you was creating then had liver problems. That elder self that you was creating then had diabetes. That, that, that elder self that you was creating then had lung cancer. Because what you was doing now was creating that elder then. Well, that, that elder to come. But now that you have went back and healed your younger self that created the elder that you are now then, now you have now freed a whole new elder that did not exist or couldn't exist because we was covering it with our depression. Does that make sense? So we now as the elder went back to our younger self Hugged ourselves, healed ourselves. Now that has now opened up a new elder for myself here and now that's guiding me towards a, a brighter, greater freedom. Rewind this back as often as you need to and practice this as often as you need to. This is self care. Self care. The self. The self that said, I am seeing my future. That is the Ashe. That is who you truly are. And when you are in tune with that self, then you are free. But if you're not in tune with that self, that Ashe, all you have left to deal with is anger, fear, depression. Is this making sense? So strive. Strive, brothers and sisters. Strive towards that freedom. Submit to God. That's all that Islam means. Submit. Be one who submits their will to God. Not my will, but thine will be done. What does that mean? When you're submitting yourself to God, you're not submitting yourself to the cigarette. The thing that you run to when you feel that depression creeping back up. When you feel that anger, God. When you feel that pain, God. When you feel that depression, God. God. Give it to God. Don't give it to the cigarette companies. Because we broke down what exactly what it does to your body. It does the same thing as anger and junk food. Don't give it to those foods. It takes time. It takes practice and it can't just be given to you. I can talk until I'm black and blue, but it boils down to you, brothers. It boils down to you, my sisters. This is self-work that has to be done. Now, you, we can come together and do this work together, but I can't do the work for you as much as I would love to. Again, that's why it's so dangerous to say that you leveled up if you haven't done this inner self-work. And this inner self-work it's something that has to be cultivated over and over and over again. It's like lifting weights. At first, you can only lift five pounds. Then you move up to 10, 15, 20. Next thing you know, you're moving them heavy. But it's always a higher level that you can go to. It's always a higher and higher and higher and higher, higher level that you can aspire and reach to. But that work has to be done. And it can't be deferred to anybody else. It can't be blamed to anybody else. This is something that we must do for ourselves. We must become new people in spirit. We must be not of the world, but free from the world, even while we're in the world. Does this make sense? Because this world promotes a demonic culture of anxiety, fear, depression, 
feeling that we're not lovely enough, beautiful enough, happy enough. They attach happiness and love and happiness and, and all this stuff with cars and jewelry and this, that, and the third. Is that not right? They attach status with being petty and all that good stuff. You know, pettiness, pettiness don't only means small-mindedness. Is this not what they do? But if you have no idea of who you actually are, you aspire to be these things. But that's not you. So you decide, then you decide to be more and more petty or whatever to fill this hole. That's the way of the world. That's the demonic traits that they do. Leave them over there. 2 Corinthians chapter 6 verse 17 says, Wherefore, come out among them and be ye separate, say of Yahweh, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will, accept, uh, and I will receive you. See, the realization of God is not a right. Yeah. It's not a right. It's a privilege. Mm -hmm. He said, I will receive you. But there was prerequisites to that. The prerequisites was come out from among them, be separate, and touch not the unclean thing. And then I will receive you. Unclean comes from the Greek root uh, 169 in the um, concordance, meaning impure, foul, unclean, demonic. <laughs> that was one of those moments when I was doing that scholarship. I was like, yo! <laughs> how do we do this? I close with the how. And if you're like a church kid like myself, church kids, mm -hmm. the way that we do this is by putting on the full armor of God. Oh yeah, we taking it back there. We taking it back to Ephesians 6 and 11. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Wiles came from the Greek 3180, meaning the method, trickery, systematic procedure, plan, Orderly arrangement, course of conduct. Devil meant traducer, false accuser, devil, slanderer. <coughs> Excuse me. Again, the devil makes evil fair seeming. The devil has a systematic procedure and a method of trickery and a course of conduct that they want you to follow. And if you submit, you give your divine innate power to the devil, which is the only way that the devil will have any power anyway. The only way that the devil has any power is if you give it to it. Remember that time in the Bible it says like, uh, God was like, devil, what are you doing? Oh, I'm going forth uh, to and fro from the earth saying who I made devour. He ain't saying I'm just going out and wrecking havoc on everybody. He said, I'm going to see who I may devour. So if he's seen who he may devour, that means that he needs permission from you. Joe, well, he's only being, you know, you know, whatever, because you got that hedge around. But if you take that hedge away, then you let me go up in there. And then he will curse his maker. And the devil tried to do all he could to Job. But Job didn't give the devil that power by denying his creator. Therefore, the devil had no power in Job. The devil then tried to tempt Christ. You know, if you just kneel before me, submit to me, I'll give you all these kingdoms and all this, that, and the third, all these, you know, those powers of riches that I was talking about in the Baba Hagida. Get thee behind me.
I ain't got time for that. Get some time. That's like Christ versus saying, fuck out of here. Sometimes you got to fuck out of here, the devil. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, fuck out of here. Because I know who I am. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What does powers mean? That broke down into the Greek. It's uh, concordance number 1849. Meaning influence. Supernatural influence. Mm. Rulers. Rulers came from 2888. Meaning a world ruler. Or an epithet of Satan. Mm. Darkness. Darkness. <laughs> came from 4655. Meaning. You ready? Shadiness. Which went to 4639, meaning shade. Are we not all the time saying, oh, you being shady. Oh, the shade. You're throwing shade at you. <laughs> throwing darkness around. Mm -hmm. Throwing darkness on the light. Because mm -hmm. most of the time when people are being shady is when a person is doing good for themselves. Mm -hmm. Person out here trying to live their best life. But here come one being petty and shady. Spiritual. What is spiritual? As in spiritual wickedness. Spiritual came from 4152 that went to uh, 4151, which meant, which meant mental disposition. But this ain't spiritual wickedness. What does wickedness mean? Wickedness came from 4189, meaning depravity. Malice, uh, calamitous, and diseased. So this is what we're fighting against. We're fighting against uh, influence, uh, supernatural influence of Satan that causes darkness, shadiness, and, and, uh, and uh, a mental disposition of depravity, malice, calamitous, and diseasedness. Sounds like the demonic culture that we were talking about in the Baba Hagida. Verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that ye may be able to withstand uh, in the evil day, having to done all stand. Evil day. Let's look up the word day. Because the day doesn't mean the same. Day comes from 2250. Day simply means a period. A day, or a while, or years. Mm. Having done all to stand, stand comes from 2476, which means to appoint, to bring, abide, covenant, establish. So when you have on the full armor of God, and it's not your clothes. It's not a dashiki. It can be a suit. You can be wearing a suit. You can be wearing nothing. It's your mental disposition. But when you have on the full armor of God, when your day comes, which is a period of time, which could be years, you will appoint its ability to affect you. You will have the ability to say, get thee behind me. You will have the ability to go back in time and give yourself a hug, heal yourself so now you can be free. This is what Christ did. Christ appointed. He wasn't appointed to. What will you establish with your appointment? Verse 14, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness. You know what's interesting? What loins meant came from 3751. Brothers, it meant procreative power. 
Speak to the brothers because on the natural end of it, you know how we procreate. That will also mean your children that you bring into the world. But it also says procreative power, procreative power, that's your ashe. And your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Peace came from 1515, meaning set at one again, quietness. Peace is quiet. Anger is not. Verse 16, above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. That's that shade that be thrown at you. Because faith, again, is what? Confidence. They're saying that your confidence is your shield. So they, when, when the world is shooting this anxiety at you, when it's throwing this depression at you, when people are throwing their shade at you, when your boss is tripping, your mom is tripping, your whatever, 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 you have that shield on you of faith of knowing who I am and what it is that I do. You have that faith knowing, that confidence knowing that wherever I am, that's where God is. So that means whatever is coming at you at any given point in time, you know how to stand because you have faith not only in yourself, but in the God that you say you represent. We doing all right? Faith, in this sense, went to 4102, which meant conviction, which is confidence, the truth itself, and reliance upon Christ. So above all, faith, confidence, conviction, truth itself, reliance on Christ. This is not lip service. A lot of lip going on. I rely on you, Lord. Right? But no. This is reliance in, to, in, in, in so far as being as Christ when your evil day comes by submitting your will to God, by, then you can appoint about peace just as Christ did. So your reliance on Christ isn't just about you talking about Christ. It's about you actually being Christ when it's time for your evil day to occur. And even doing greater things if you bowed it. <laughs> Verse 17. Take on the helmet of salvation and the sword of spirit, which is the word of God. Spirit came from 4151, meaning, check this out, the breath, the spirit, the vital principle. This is what we were talking about, the Ashe, this whole lecture. It also meant, it also means Christ's spirit, the Holy Spirit, God. And the last definition, brothers and sisters, was the mind. Mm -hmm. Woo! Mm -hmm. The sword of spirit, mm -hmm. the breath, the spirit, the vital principle, Christ's spirit, the Holy Spirit, God is your mind. Mm -hmm. This is why the devil has no power unless you give it to him. Mm -hmm. The power is in your mind, but if you give your mind to the devil, then the devil got power over you. But if you can hold control of your mind in the truth in itself, that truth in itself is that you should have faith. The faith is your confidence in yourself. <laughs> it all boils. It, it's like a, it's like a roller coaster. It's like it all comes back to you. And it all goes back to God. It all comes back to your fellowship and your relationship with the creator that you say that you have a relationship with. But it cannot be lip service because faith without works is dead. Carol Rich just had an album called The World Is Mind. M-I-N-D. That brother was on point. Don't, whatever you see is because you see it. Because you're appointing 
what it is that you see with the vocabulary you have. Do you have the com do you have the vocabulary of faith, of confidence? Or that you a nigga? Worthless. Deserving of death. Mm -hmm. This is what the Ashe is. Ashe means it is similar to Amen. It's, a, it's like an ending of a prayer. Like, I command it to be so. It is so. That's the word of God. So you must allow your it is so to run through you. What does your it is so say it is? <laughs> word. The, the word word comes from 4487. Meaning narration, command, and utterance. And I close. Brothers and sisters, we have been fighting a war with the wrong weapons. Those who are of Olodumari stock have the power to appoint. They have the confidence and that is the basis of manhood and womanhood. Having that confidence of knowing that wherever you are, God is. And that is also the presence of Ashe. Thank you for listening. I greet you in the words of peace from the Moa Temple. Nugazere ti'u. Peace be unto you. In divine oneness, my name is Moa Olodumare. Peace.